When Brett first asked me the question, what would you tell your 22-year-old self? My immediate answer was, there is so much. And then my next thought was, I'm not sure I would have listened. Because when you're a young coach, even when you want to hear and you're straining to, it's hard because experience carves capacity. I cannot imagine a coach on the planet who has uh, watched Whiplash and not had an absolute visceral reaction. Like we watch that dreamer, he comes out and he passionately pursues greatness and he is undeniably disciplined and focused and his love for his craft is absolute. We love this guy, like we want him on our team, right? And then seemingly while we're blinking, his stitches pop and all the nonsense and the twistedness just oozes out and the shift is really subtle. It's kind of like that exercise that we've all done when you're looking at the picture, uh, the sketch, the pencil drawing of a really beautiful lady and if you look at it long enough, then it becomes this craggly old woman and then once you see it, you can only see the ugly. It's kind of what happened to the drummer in Whiplash. And I remember when I was watching the, the scene in the movie theater and I'm looking up at the big screen and it's the breakup scene at the diner and, and he's saying all the nonsense that you heard earlier. I'm looking at the screen and, I, screen and I just want to scream at it and say, I wish you could hear yourself. But the drummer slide to the wasteland is so obvious to everybody except him. If youth knew, if age could, uh, my fellow Carter County descendant, uh, Mike Holder, uh, from rural Oklahoma, quoting Freud, I get the biggest kick out of that, I gotta tell you. But Coach Holder's interview was especially poignant to me, and I don't know if it's because he is no longer coaching and he was looking back on his career, or if it was just simply the raw vulnerability of it, but he watched the scene from the diner from Whiplash, he watched the breakup scene, and he said, that was me, I was the drummer. And then with a twinkle in his eye, he said, but I kept the girl. And I got to believe that Coach Holder's wife is the axis around which his world turns. And it became pretty apparent to me that she was probably the anchor that tethered him when he got lost. Coach Holder was a tremendous golf coach. There's no doubt about that. He got away from those things that mattered most to him. And, and when I think about his wife, I think about him pointing, making it a pointed moment to say without saying that we got to have people who remind us of what is most important. Because you can get lost in this world of make-believe and start to decide that who wins and loses games is actually important. And we need people who will remind us of what really is. We heard from Mary Wise, and she said that she saw herself as a failure. She's among the top 2% of her peers in her sport, and she saw herself as a failure because of the lens that she looked through. And I gotta tell you, if that doesn't cause us to pause for a second and pay attention, then I'm not sure what will, because if that can happen to Mary Wise, that can happen to anybody. Perspective is hard to get, and it's slippery to hold. We heard from Urban Meyer today, and he said, and I quote, that I became the man that I didn't want to be. He was sitting in what the world would view as the highest seat there is, but his feet didn't touch the ground. And as a result of that, he had a meltdown. And the courage that is required to recognize the chasm that exists between those two definitions of success and the investment and discipline that is necessary to build a bridge that gets you from one to the other is immense. You know what Coach Meyer did? He leaned on his natural inclinations. He did what coaches do best. He made a practice plan, complete with time increments that would not waver. And he posted signs around his office and around the football complex that reminded him of the man that he wanted to be. What Urban Meyer did was he built a strategy to save him from himself. Bob Stoops is not entirely different, only his wasn't quite as intentional. It was a little bit more evolutionary. Coach Stoops is a legend on our campus for his balance. I can remember years ago saying, when I grow up, I want to be like Bob. I want to be like Bob because he doesn't ever seem busy. 
And we all had the same pulls, except his were times 10. And somehow, I know part of it had to do with his personality. Part of it's just how he is built as a human being. But part of it is also the normalcy that comes when you're aligned with your values. There was an absence of internal conflict with Coach Stoops. He was following an example planted by his father and watered by Steve Spurrier. And because of that, his parallel walk with his value system was as natural as breathing. You heard him say about his trips to Children's Hospital that he was searching for community and he found perspective. And on the surface, that sounds really lucky. I got to tell you, Bob Stoops taught me to listen for luck. He was always aware enough to allow himself to be pulled by the most important things. So why do we choose this profession in the first place? What is it that makes us get into coaching? For most of us, I think it's very noble. Like We want to do it because we love the game. We want to get involved because of the life lessons that it taught us, because we want to give back. We want to make a difference. We want to make an impact. It's a noble road. And yet nobody really tells us about the invisible dragons or the camouflage sinkholes along the way. We just go to work. And then we do well. And then people clap, and somebody hands us some scissors to cut down a net, or they give us a trophy. And suddenly, it's never enough. The siren song of perfection lures us so softly that we don't even know we're being sung to. You realize that even winning doesn't satisfy what you really need, whatever that need is. The vortex makes us dizzy. You get confused. It's like the wacky hall of mirrors where everything you see is distorted especially yourself. The suction of expectation, boy, it guts you and even takes your joy. The environment can get so dark and the tunnel so straight and narrow that we can't see the poor decisions that we might be making. And we sure can't see their tentacles, nor can we see the consequences that can grow from those. So ultimately, what these giants and their respective sports today have showed us is that we have to fight constantly for a clear lens. That the championships that we've watched them scratch and claw to win and that have been so well documented by the world, those are obvious. But what they showed us today was a little glimpse into the internal struggle of what to do with it all. When I first did the What's Important to You exercise, I was in a head coach's round table. You all did it today. You did the what's important to you exercise. You have a list of things. And when you compare it to the things that society values most, it's absolutely ludicrous, right? You look at it, and it's silly. The first time I did this exercise, we're in a head coach's round table, and we're in partners. And the partner across the table for me is a three-time national championship coach. And when she finished making her list of all the things that are most important to her alongside of society's scorecard, she put her pencil down and she said, what are we doing? Seriously? Like, this is our life? And we both laughed. That empathetic, deep belly laugh that comes from the marrow of your gut. When you experience the exact same feeling at the exact same moment. And then our eyes locked and they were glassy and neither one of us dared blink for fear of the water spilling. Because we know it is.